of a collision resistant hash functions and specifically the parallel complexity of such uh, domain extensions. Namely, how many rounds does the uh, scheme, the final scheme, have to uh, invoke uh, the underlying function f? And as my students taught me, the best way to uh, ex explain something is by way of example. So let's uh, review the well-known uh, uh, domain extension paradigms that you are all probably familiar with, like the merkel damgard uh, scheme that takes as input a message divided into blocks and an initial vector iv and applies f iteratively where each application of f uh, uh, needs to have the uh, result of the previous application and therefore all in all the output of the the uh, the construction is the output of the last uh, invocation of f and all in all we have a linear number of uh, iterations where linear in the number of uh, blocks of the original message. Uh, so this is a very, very good uh, uh, domain extension scheme, but not when you consider the uh, complexity, uh, the parallel complexity. So uh, maybe uh, the Merkle tree is an improvement where in this, uh, in this scheme, you, uh, F is applied in the form of a binary tree where uh, at each level, we apply F to the results of the uh, previous level, and finally the output of the scheme is the output at the root of the tree. And this is a, a, a great improvement. Uh, uh, we have a, a, an exponential improvement from being linear. We have a logarithmic number of uh, rounds, of course, to the underlying function, but uh, we would like to be even better than that. We like to go constant. Can we have a constant uh, a number of rounds? And Maurer and Tesaro showed how to obtain a, a two-round domain extension scheme. Um, and their scheme is almost as, uh, as good as you can expect. It's uh, two rounds, but it falls a bit short uh, from, the, from going fully uh, parallel, namely a single round of calls. It does uh, uh, obtain a, a stronger uh, a stronger property, which is called indifferentiability, which is a notion of indistinguishability from random uh, proposed by Maurer, Renner, and Hollenstein. And one drawback of this uh, 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 construction for me is that I couldn't uh, draw it uh, on a slide, on a single slide at least. And let's go back to our question. So the question is, how parallel can you go? Can you go fully parallel? And, and this is a, a very interesting question, especially when you are concerned with uh, uh, hardware applications of, uh, of uh, hash functions. And can we do it? So I won't uh, keep you intense uh, too long. I will tell you that uh, the main result is uh, affirmative. Yes, we can. We construct a fully uh, parallel domain extension scheme. Uh, and that has a single round of polynomially many uh, invocations of F. And uh, in the random oracle model, it guarantees collision resistance and some notion of being random-like, which we call uh, weak indifferentiability. It's very simple. And it has a nice property that is it preserves the algebraic uh, degree of the underlying function F. So take any uh, of your favorite uh, function f to replace the random oracle, uh, uh, our construction will have the same algebraic degree as your function. Uh, uh, to compare with previous uh, constructions, all constructions have at least two rounds, so they are uh, going to be at least quadratic in the original uh, uh, function. Or, uh, they have a quadratic degree in the, uh, uh, the degree of f. So let's move on to describing the, the construction. I will describe a general paradigm for uh, obtaining parallel domain extension, fully parallel. You take the original message, now don't divide it into uh, blocks. You apply a deterministic function uh, uh, to it, and we will call this function a code. And you obtain C of M. You divide C of M uh, into blocks, and you apply F independently to each of the blocks. And finally, you 
XOR the results of the, uh, these applications, and that's the whole construction. The output is uh, uh, the XOR of all the applications, and it's very easy to see that there is only one single round of calls to the underlying function f. It's very easy to see that the construction is simple, and the only question, so you, you take the message, you apply a code, and then you apply XOR. So the only question is, what should the code be? What do we need to require from the code? So in order to understand that, let's say, uh, uh, define security in the random oracle model. So here we consider an unbounded adversary that is bounded by the number of calls it can uh, uh, make to the uh, function, to the oracle f. And having this security uh, definition in, in mind, now we can think uh, uh, about what should be required from the code C. Maybe the code C uh, is not required at all. And how do we understand that? Again, by way of examples, by way of attacking the, the scheme. So let me re remind you that to attack the scheme, the adversary is required to come up with two distinct code words that collide on the scheme, namely, if you XOR uh, all the uh, F applied all, to all the blocks of X, and you XOR all F applied to all the blocks of Y, you get the same result. And the reason I can uh, consider code words is because giving two colliding code words, an unbounded adversary can uh, re uh, recover the original messages without querying the oracle at all. Okay. So let's try uh, with a very simple code. Let's uh, assume that we don't need the code at all. Maybe the code can be the identity. Every code word, every word is a code word. And it's very easy to attack this scheme with this code. Just take any code word that has two blocks that disagree and take it again, only interchange these two blocks. And by symmetry of the XOR function, no matter what f is, um, these two codes words are going to collide. So um, we actually found a collision. So the XOR, on, the XOR of all the results of f on all the blocks are going to be the same for the two code words because they are the same blocks. And we actually found a collision without ever asking any query to the oracle. So this is not good. So let's require that the code is well ordered. Namely, no block can appear in two different indices. So this block, if it appears in the first, uh, as a first block, it cannot appear as a second block for any two code words. OK, so obtaining uh, uh, this, uh, this, this is uh, well ordered. Uh, uh, obtaining it, it's uh, not too difficult, but one way to do it is just by augmenting each of the blocks with its index. So we cannot use the identity. Let's use the well-ordered identity. Namely, if each block is going to have a prefix that is any string and a suffix that is the index of the code, uh, the block. And let's try to attack the protocol. We take for a, as, a, as a pair for x, we'll take a, a code word y that disagrees with x on each and every block on the prefix. And now we can ask ourselves, what is the probability that these two code words collide? Well, this is going to be very small. It's 2 to the minus k, where k is the size of the block. And this is not going to be a, a very successful attack. However, the adversary can create, using these two code words or these two n blocks, it can create 2 to the n code words by simply taking all the choices of uh, taking subsets of uh, uh, blocks from x and the remaining uh, blocks from y. There are 2 to the n such uh, uh, possibilities. And since 2 to the n is much uh, larger than 2 to the k, by the pigeonhole uh, principle, we're going to have an, a, a collision. And the adversary only needed to uh, query the oracle on 2 n uh, uh, blocks. And this brings us to the next requirement. You cannot construct too many uh, words from a few blocks. Uh, and another requirement is going to be that the code is, uh, uh, needs to have a, a large Hamming distance between any two code words. And this is a bit more subtle to see why it happens, not getting into it. 
Um, so having this requ these requirements uh, in mind, one may think, where can we find such a code? Well, luckily they exist. They are called least recoverable, least recoverable codes. And let me uh, introduce you to them. Uh, they are generalizations of unique uh, error correction code with unique decoding. These are codes that take uh, the message M and return a, 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 a code word C of M such that if, for example, Alice wants to send Bob a C of M, the blocks of C of M over a noisy channel such that most of the blocks are going to arrive safely but some alpha fraction of the blocks may be corrupted on the way, still we are guaranteed that the decoding algorithm, algorithm will un uniquely find the original message M. Another extension of that is what's called list decoding, where the decoding algorithm no longer returns a, a recovers a unique message, but rather a, a list of L messages. And we are guaranteed that the original message M lies within these L messages. Finally, the next generalization is list recoverable codes. In this scenario, when Alice sends the blocks of C of M to Bob, he, uh, Bob does not only uh, get one block for each index, but rather a list of possible blocks for each of the indices, and we call the uh, list of uh, blocks for the index i, ti. And now uh, the guarantee is that the original message is alpha consistent with the union of these blocks, namely that for at least alpha fraction of the indices i, the actual block of the code word at index i appears in the list ti. So this happens for at least alpha fraction of the blocks. Furthermore, there are not too many such words, uh, uh, such messages that are alpha consistent with uh, the ti's, as long as uh, uh, t is not too big. And finally, we have a recovery algorithm that given these TIs, recovers all the big L list uh, messages that uh, are alpha consistent with the TIs. So let me formally define list recoverable codes. A, a, a code C is alpha, small L, big L, list recoverable. If for all sets of blocks of size at most small L, there are at most big L uh, strings that are alpha list recoverable sorry, that, that are alpha uh, consistent with uh, T. Uh, and this is a reminder what alpha uh, consistent means. And let me distinguish between two cases. The case that alpha equals one is closely related to unbalanced expanders and was already used by Maurer and Tesaro uh, when they constructed their two-round scheme. And in this uh, work, we uh, uh, require that alpha is strictly smaller than one and we show that it's actually necessary to go from two rounds to a single round of calls. And this is uh, strongly related to random, randomness condensers. And uh, actually, when uh, the, the code, one of the codes that we use is the code of uh, Guru Swami, Umans, and Vadan uh, that was presented in the context of condenser. And it's uh, based on the code of Pavarish and Vardy, uh, who is, which is also uh, list recoverable. And their code is alpha, small l, big l, list recoverable, where big L can be uh, uh, anything up to 2 to the k over c, where k is the, le uh, the length of each of the blocks, and c is some constant. And you can see that small l, the number of queries that the adversary can ask, is practically as good as you can expect since on average, every n blocks allow you to construct on average one uh, constant number of uh, 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 strings, uh, code words. Um, and their code has a, a nice uh, property that uh, uh, it is linear over the binary field. So now that we know that uh, least recoverable uh, codes exist, we can, we can say the converse, converse of saying that we require them, they are also uh, sufficient for us. So our main theorem is that if you give us a, a, 
a code, see that it is alpha, small l, big L, list recoverable, and you plug it in our uh, construction as this code, then our construction is big L squared over 2 to the k collision resistant against any adversary that makes at most L uh, queries to the oracle. And this is as good as, good as you get since it's a, a, a right with the bound of the birthday attack that is applicable to any hash function. Um, so uh, uh, plugging in the GUV uh, code, we get a, a, we can get many choices of parameters, but one choice is to allow the adversary two to the k over four queries, and in this case, L, big L will be still two to the k over four, and more importantly, the probability that uh, the attacker finds an, a, a collision is going to be smaller than two to the minus k over four. And our construction is going to be degree preserving in the algebraic degree of f. Uh, but, so someone can say, okay, you got uh, collision resistance, but you used a, a random oracle. Maybe, maybe you should give us some, something else, right? Maybe like indifferentiability, I don't know. Maybe you can act like a, a, you're random. And if we were optimistic, maybe it would be nice to, uh, to hope that uh, uh, our construction as is, is random-like in some sense. And this would uh, allow us to use applications that are central in cryptography, like uh, the Fiat Shamir paradigm, which I'm not, I'm going to s just skim through. You take a public coin three message uh, proof system and you obtain a single uh, message proof system. And then you can uh, apply Killian's and uh, Fiat Shamir and get uh, a, a sublinear non-interactive argument for any NP language. So this is really good. And it turns out that we uh, can prove some notion of uh, uh, indistinguishability from random. We define it uh, as weak indifferentiability. And it's a relaxed notion of the indifferentiability uh, I mentioned before. And it turns out that it's, it suffices. We can prove, we prove in the paper that it suffices for the above applications. So this is a nice uh, uh, addition. And uh, to sum it all, we have all the applications that, are, uh, uh, that require collision resistance and all the applications that I just mentioned that require a, in this, some form of indistinguishability from random. And all these applications are going to have a, a low round uh, complexity, specifically just as an example, the sublinear commitment is going to be one parallel, so is the fiat Shamir paradigm. And the last one, since it uses both, is going to be two parallel. Um, so I just need to note that uh, uh, if you compare other parameters, for example, with the Merkle tree, then we have some loss uh, in parameters, which depend on the, uh, the number of queries you, ask, you uh, allow the adversary to make. So to conclude, um, we have uh, the first fully parallel domain extension scheme. And in the random oracle model, it, rec uh, it guarantees collision resistance and weak indifferentiability. It is simple, and it is degree preserving. And it has all the applications that I just mentioned. And a few open questions. Well, it would be nice to have a cleaner implementation of F replacing the random oracle and maybe even a low degree uh, implementation, which will uh, make use of the degree preserving property of our construction. Uh, however, we don't really uh, know what are the uh, sufficient and necessary requirements for, from such a, 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 an underlying function f. We do know that collision resistance of f uh, is not sufficient nor necessary for the collision resistance of our construction. And finally, uh, list recoverable codes seem like a very nice primitive to have and seem, uh, like it seems like they should have other uh, applications in cryptography. And that's it. Thank you very much.